Elizabeth I is presented by Rakuten, the most rewarding way to shop. This podcast is intended for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Well, I was in the bath bathtub. Uh, Eddie answered the phone, and I was getting so sick of it. I really didn't want to do it. The first script was terrible. And I said, yeah, tell him I'll do it for a million dollars and 10% of the absolute gross, which was absurd, and I meant it to be absurd. And Eddie came back and said through the door, he said, okay, it's a deal. I just screamed and dove under the water, (laughs) inhaling more water because I was laughing so hard. That was Elizabeth Taylor, in her own words, describing the moment where we last left her on her ascent to becoming Elizabeth I, the world's first influencer as we define it today. What's known as the bathtub deal was the legendary moment that Elizabeth Taylor negotiated her record-breaking salary for the role of Cleopatra. This boss move would go on to break the studio system that once exploited her and every artist in her genre. Whether she realized it or not at the time, it was the moment when Elizabeth used her influence to transform an entire industry. As we continue in this series to tell the story of how Elizabeth Taylor became the first influencer, we'll dissect these pivotal moments, and we'll see that at the core of each of them is another story, one that epitomizes who Elizabeth Taylor was as an artist, a woman, a boss, and then who she became as a mogul, an activist, an agent of change. With the pivotal moment of the bathtub deal, Elizabeth had recently lost her husband and the love of her life, Mike Todd, in a shocking plane crash. Somehow, she had the fortitude and the wherewithal to seize the moment when a studio was begging her to make their epic film and shatter the way business was done. Understanding this gives us a glimpse into another element at Elizabeth's core, tragedy. Tragedy, the kind that life throws at you, no matter how well you live it, was a formidable and relentless obstacle for Elizabeth Taylor. She triumphed from the life and death tragedy of losing Mike Todd to catapult herself to the top of her career, all while raising three young children on her own. In this episode, we'll dissect the details of that triumph, beginning with the nuances of the bathtub deal and witness Elizabeth's reinvention of herself as a woman without compromise. I'm Katy Perry, and this is Elizabeth I. This is Lala Kent. This episode is presented by Rakuten. I downloaded the Rakuten app and it has quickly become the app that I use the most on my phone. Anytime I want to buy something, I check the Rakuten app first. You can get cash back at over 3,500 stores. And seriously, who doesn't like to save money? Because that's literally one of my obsessions. And the cash back is sent to you hassle-free. It's deposited directly into your PayPal account or Rakuten will mail you a check. Membership is completely free and it's so easy to sign up. I think it took me all of 60 seconds to get my account set up and I actually did it myself. I didn't have my mom help. I didn't have Jess help. It's a moment I was proud of. And you can get anything and everything through Rakuten. Clothing, shoes, electronics, travel, kitchen and home essentials, and toys and games. I just got O the cutest shoes and a bunch of new books, which she's obsessed with. We read stories every single night before bedtime. I did it through Rakuten, and I got cash back on both. I mean, it's a no-brainer to earn cash back on stuff you are going to buy anyway. So start all of your shopping trips at Rakuten.com or get the Rakuten app to start saving today. This is chapter three, the boss who played queen. So Elizabeth was really like, she was ready to be married to this big showman and, and, and have her life be his life and not have to make movies. 
And so, you know, he got her out of the contract, said, let her finish Cat on Hutch and Roof and, and be done with it. Now, come on, she's been working for you guys forever. So Mike got her out of it. We don't have, unfortunately, the memorandum from that period that would have maybe sh- correspondence that would show the back and forth of how those deals were negotiated. There aren't letters, but she does talk about this. <laughs> Liz, Liz, what about your own career? Uh, are you going to continue making movies or just be a housewife? Well, I couldn't really um, care less about making movies, to tell you the truth. I consider it much more important to be a good woman than a great actress, or any kind of an actress. In her last two contracts with MGM for Cat on a Hot Tin Roof that she actually signed less than a month before Mike Todd's death that stipulated it was essentially a a termination agreement, but that she would do Cat on a Hot Tin Roof and then one more film with MGM to be determined within three years from the end of Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. MGM had three years to figure out another film that they would want her to be in. But then Mike tragically died in this horrible plane crash, and it was a terrible loss. And he kind of left her in a precarious financial situation. Mike Codd was wildly successful, but also wildly unsuccessful. He was a a gambler, and he left her with, you know, some debt. And he had given me a 29-carat emerald cut engagement ring which I had to sell because the insurance had a small clause saying that if he were killed in a small aircraft, all the insurance would be liquidated. So I had $17,000 in the bank to maintain myself, a house, rent a house, a nanny, a cook, a maid, because I was working. And I had to sell very precious things, which broke my heart. So she kind of was forced to keep going. So she did Butterfield 8, which was the film that MGM wanted her to do, cast her as a call girl. And she did not want to do, she, she always hated that role, which she ironically got her first Oscar for. It made me very determined to sort of say, screw you, world, I'm going to get out of this. I was doing Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. I got over my stutter. I did Butterfield Day because um, it was a handshake between Mike and the studio, and it was to be my last film with MGM. After 18 years, one day on the set, one of the vice presidents, a friend of mine, came down with a manila envelope under his arm and said, well, honey, here's your next project. And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, well, you're still, you have one more film under your contract. And I said, you you and, and Mike shook hands that this would be my last film. I was being offered a fortune by Fox to be Cleopatra. And they said, no, no, you, you, uh, you can't do that until you finish this, your obligation. Then your contract will be up. And I was so furious. Don't you bastards have any sense of honor? Doesn't a handshake mean anything to you? And they said, no, it has to be on paper, dear. But I did. Butterfield 8, and it was my last film at MGM. So I was so young, and I had three children, and I had to assume the role of husband, wife, mother, father, uh, breadwinner, and I just wanted to be taken care of. I missed Mike so much. Although Elizabeth resented playing a high-end prostitute in Butterfield 8, Her performance won critical acclaim and her first Oscar. I don't really know how to express my gratitude for this and for everything. I guess all I can do is say thank you. 
Thank you with all my heart. But what Elizabeth had actually won, had earned, by negotiating her exit from MGM with that final film for them, was control over her career. And her acting success was the playing card that she was happily willing to fold in order to win the life that she wanted with Mike Todd as a wife and mother. For Elizabeth Taylor, forging a multi-million dollar acting career was not her winning hand. But because of Mike's death, of her tragic loss, of the debt left behind, that was a card on the table. And if she played it, she could not only survive, but triumph. As Mike would have seen it as well, Cleopatra was the ace in the hole. The sheer amount of paperwork and back and forth between lawyers, agents, and executives involved in how Elizabeth cut that deal is one of the biggest secrets in the business. Though you might remember $1 million when you hear the words Cleopatra and Elizabeth Taylor, there's much more to the legend than has been told, and it's even more impressive. Elizabeth's archivist found the receipts for the first time ever. This is the full story. She was, I think, starting to try and take control of her life, but then tragedy and life got in the way. She had to change her plans. Whether she would act again was to be seen, but either way, she would not be beholden to the studio or another company. She could be independent and make those decisions for herself. Um, I finally got away from MGM and was one of the first ones to start my own company and make my own deals and go without an agent. And I enjoyed dealing with the studios and telling them where to go. Uh, that was nice. And I was quite a good businesswoman. So with Cleopatra, Elizabeth is finally free of MGM. She can make her own choices and she uses that power to grab them by the balls. The producers want Elizabeth. Everyone wants Elizabeth. They had tested for other actresses, and hands down, it, it was to be Elizabeth. And they, the budget kept going up and up and up to account for all of this. She may have told the story in a more humble way that she's only offered that outrageous number to get them to go away, but believe me, Elizabeth knew what she was doing. So as an archivist, I was excited to dig into the contracts and start digitizing those, cataloging them. And with Cleopatra, of course, I had this, as most of the public does, this legend in my mind of the million dollars. And I don't know if I expected to just see, you know, one million dollars there uh, right in the first line for the compensation. But you know, maybe a little part of me expected to see something like that. So I start reading through the Cleopatra contract, and I see that the base compensation was $125,000 to be paid over a period of uh, 10 weeks with a six-week time for, I guess, off, off time. So it would be a total 16-week production. And so I thought to myself, well, that's not really close to a million dollars. In fact, that's her, that was her compensation for Cat on a Hot Tin Roof and for Butterfield 8 for her previous films. Now, granted, the, those were paid out at a lower rate and over a longer period of time, um, but still that struck me as a little odd. And so then I keep reading down and I see another number, which was 50000 and that was per week of overtime. Cleopatra. The production is, was famously a, a fiasco, a mess it took over two years. She couldn't have known that this film would take as long as it did and that she would be getting 70 weeks of, of overtime. I mean, that, that, that explains it, right, of how she was ended up, it wasn't just a million dollars because at, at the end of the day, she ended up getting several million dollars when all things were said and done, so it was even arguably better. I started doing some more digging and ended up finding something that had actually been in the public for quite a long time, which is Walter 
Wangers, who was the producer, again, of Cleopatra, his production diary, which he published shortly, I believe, before his death in the late 1960s. And so I thought, okay, if he you know, must have been in the room when these negotiations were happening as the, the liaison between the studio and like there, there has to be something in there. And sure enough, there was a lot of great information that we were able to glean from that. One being that the process of negotiation took almost a full year from the time where Elizabeth said, okay, I'll do it for a million dollars to actually signing a contract was something like 11 months. There's a, a kind of a famous uh, video of her in the, the 20th Century Fox offices signing a contract for uh, Cleopatra, and this was in October of 59. Well, it turns out that was just a publicity stunt. She wasn't actually signing anything. The picture casting achievement of the year is about to become a recorded fact as producer Walter Wanger introduces Elizabeth Taylor to 20th Century Fox executive producer Buddy Adler. The occasion, the Hollywood signing of the exotic Elizabeth for the most exotic role in her career. And the role Cleopatra. What a role. And Liz is the gal to do it justice. They filmed this so <laughs> they they could prove to the investors and to the studio that they really had a star that was interested. They just needed to get the details of the contract finessed and worked out. More months go by, and you can already see that he has some entries in there where he understands that the production is already in trouble. They didn't yet have a full script. The, the organization of the production wasn't really coherent. He clearly had an inkling that things were going to take longer than expected, for one. There was another entry where he was discussing the project with Elizabeth Taylor while she was in New York, and he made a comment about how Elizabeth was complaining about the weather and come down severe bout of pneumonia. Walter writes in this journal that he wonders how Elizabeth is going to fare in London, given that she's already struggling with the weather in New York. And London, of course, is where Cleopatra was originally set to be filmed, and the first part of the production was indeed there. Walter has an entry in which he's looking through the contract, and he's trying to see it from Elizabeth's perspective, and thinking that it's, it's working out really good for her. And I'm sure this has to do with his knowledge of the production and knowing that it's going to take a lot longer than 16 weeks. I don't think he thought it was going to take two years, but he knew it was going to take longer than 16 weeks. And I'm sure that was part of the deal where they said, look, you're guaranteed this $125,000. And Elizabeth also made remarks that she was okay with it being spread out because she wanted to put most of it anyway into a trust for her children. So it didn't all need to be up front. They massage the deal in this way by saying, it's going to take longer and you're going to be getting that 50000 a week. Six, six to seven million. The seven million dollars is what we should be celebrating. The seven million she received for the picture is the equivalent of 60 million today. Long before George Lucas had cut his legendary Star Wars deal or Jack Nicholson got a savvy back end for his Joker role in Batman, that paid out handsomely. Elizabeth Taylor negotiated a record salary contract, back-end ownership of the gross profits, and a crafty accumulation of overtime that paid out handsomely, because she knew more about what it took to make a movie than any director, producer, or studio executive in the industry. Elizabeth did it all first. Cleopatra was by far the most expensive film ever made up until Kevin Costner and Waterworld in the 90s. Remember, when they started shooting Cleopatra in London, the world hated her. They were still against her. It was during her marriage to Eddie Fisher. She had broken up America's sweetheart couple, and this is what she was facing in her private life while she's going to shoot the biggest film that's ever happened. But as it turned out on Cleopatra, the press was the least of anyone's problems, especially Elizabeth. In her friendship with Montgomery Clift, Elizabeth had already seen how tragedy can swallow an artist. 
In every moment where she had finally gained control and set herself on the path of happiness, the future she believed in was ripped away. With every tragic turn, the stakes kept being raised. After surviving the gauntlet of the loss of her husband, the only life and death stakes that could top that were her own. That's the one where I almost died. The escalating, behind-the-scenes catastrophes with Cleopatra began with the director's and studio's ludicrous decision to film the epic story of an ancient Egyptian queen in the gloomy bogs of England. How can you make England in the winter look like the Mediterranean? Fox made the ludicrous decision to shoot Cleopatra in, the, in England in the dead of winter. That is just the first step of an escalating budget and so many catastrophes that that film had. The making of Cleopatra is more dramatic, more wild, more wasteful. I think that all the studio heads at Fox were just running around like with chick like chickens with their heads cut off. It just kept growing and they just kept throwing more money at the problems. With Elizabeth and everything that was going on and the investment they had made, it just snowballed and it kept getting worse and worse. But the, the, really the first bad decision was when they decided to shoot Cleopatra in England in the winter. Back in the United States after her brush with death in London, Elizabeth Taylor is carried from her plane in a wheelchair. The arrival at New York of the actress who was in England to play the title role in Cleopatra is graphically filmed. She takes the excitement like the true trooper she is, though she's still weak from her bout with an exceptionally virulent form of pneumonia. Elizabeth almost immediately gets sick. They end up not even filming any of her scenes. I think the only parts that she filmed were like costume tests. She gets better, she comes back to work, and then she gets pneumonia again, and then she gets really sick and has to have an emergency tracheotomy. I knew I had pneumonia, and I was in an oxygen tent, and I had a nurse, and she kept checking me and removed all my nail polish, and one time she checked me, and I, my nails were turning blue. And she dialed the operator and said, is there any doctor registered in the hotel? Well, it just so happened that I was in the Oliver Messel suite, and there was the Oliver Messel um, party room two steps away, and they were giving an engagement party for a young Welsh doctor. And in the room was Dr. Lord Evans, and he came screaming in the room, and by this time, I'm all blue. And he picked me up by the feet. He was six foot four. He picked me up by the feet and shook me like a rag doll, expecting me to lose some of the stuff that was clogged up in my lungs. Nothing. He pounded my ribs. Well, you should react to the loosening up of it and regurgitate. Then the thing that you react to the most is pain, where they try and gouge your eyes out. That's the last resort. And he did that. And I opened my eyes and I looked up at this man and I said, what the fuck are you doing? Excuse me, audience. And then I went, there's my tracheotomy. I'm very proud of that. She literally went through that tunnel of white light, which at that time people didn't talk about, and she saw Mike Todd. In the era of Elizabeth's fame, celebrities didn't share their honest emotional or especially spiritual experiences no matter how shallow or how deep, ever. No one in the public eye did. To share something as intimate as a near-death experience was unthinkable for anyone in the spotlight. But they were not Elizabeth Taylor. 
As the press declared, most beautiful woman in the world and the highest paid actor in history, Elizabeth Spotlight was the brightest of all. How did she survive and thrive where others would have been destroyed? Authenticity. And a brilliant technique that came from her soul. Elizabeth's unique ability to not care about her press, to not let it define her, while simultaneously using it wherever possible to both share who she was and advance the spotlight onto those who were less fortunate, who actually needed to have their stories told, was her most remarkable skill. It was a gift. Born from total unflinching honesty. I really wanted to die. And when I almost did die in London, I went through the tunnel experience, out of body experience. And when I came to, there were 11 people in the room and I had to put my hand over the tracheotomy. And I told them the story of being in the tunnel and seeing the light, which was warm and welcoming, but so white. But it wasn't cold, it was warm. And these shadowy figures going different ways until Mike came to me and embraced me. And I knew I was home. Mike said, you have to go back. And she was like, I'm not going back. I mean, Mike had only died a little bit earlier and she was grieving hard still. And she wanted to be with him. And so, but he pushed her to go back. And I sobbed with joy. And he said, no, baby, you have to go back. I'll be here waiting for you. But you have something to do, something very important. And you can't come over yet. When your time is right, I will be here. But you have to fight with all your life. What's in you now gather up your strength your will your love and turn around and fight with all the determination you're fighting to stay here and go back and i said that i didn't want to and he physically i remember his touch he physically turned me around, and I could see the hospital room and me lying in the bed. After five minutes, I was back in my body. I'd been dead for five minutes. Elizabeth's willingness to be open about her life, to share herself without apology, served a critical role in her triumph over tragedy. In the coming obstacles she'll face, we'll see how her ability to throw herself open to the public became her engine of power and influence. Elizabeth could connect to an audience, to the public, to the people living beyond the cocoon of fame and celebrity, and resonate with their humanity. It was another of Elizabeth's first as a celebrity and a human being. Elizabeth was fully self-expressed. Her ability to be vulnerable, to be human, to share her passions and flaws, to refuse to hide, would become the tenets of her power as an influencer. That's when the world turned around and forgave her for the whole Eddie, Debbie debacle. And then she won the Butterfield 8 Oscar. And they took all the sets down in England because it wasn't conducive to the weather and did it all in Rome. And they started fresh. Starting fresh on the biggest and most expensive movie production of all time meant new negotiations on Elizabeth's contract. Show business is a business after all. The contract for Cleopatra then was slightly renegotiated because they then transferred the production. The director dropped out. They had to get a new director. Most of the actors that they had in the lead roles had to be recast because they had other commitments at that point. They moved the production to Italy. This is something that we do have in the archive. It's a, it's a revised synopsis 
of the uh, Cleopatra Agreement, in which it stipulates that Elizabeth Taylor agrees that she has already received the base compensation of $125,000, and that she will work for eight weeks without compensation, and then for every week thereafter she would receive the 40% of the salary, which the $50,000 per week. And she also was able to get in there uh, a $3,000 a week stipend for expenses. They would supply a Rolls Royce and a chauffeur, housing, all of that. By the time she started on the Italian production in, I think it was September of 61, she filmed her last scene in June of the next year in 62. And so she had work eight weeks for free, and then the rest of that time was she was getting paid overtime. And by the time Cleopatra started filming again, the marriage with Eddie was already failing. The friends who had found each other in a moment of grief discovered that the comfort they offered one another could not last. And for Elizabeth, there was a career to finally harness and drive on her own, for her own worth, once she did. The universe offered up a worthy response for the woman who courageously put so much of herself into the world, so much work, love, and passion. I had met him before, and he flirted like mad with me. And I said, I'm not going to be another notch on his belt. Little did I know. Richard Burton. If he had an Instagram profile today, it just might eclipse mine. Burton burned on the screen. He chewed the stage. He picked the greatest lines from the greatest playwrights from his teeth and swallowed with a lick of a lip and satisfactory smack that left an audience satiated, knowing they'd just been served the meal of their lives. He was that good, and his craft oozed from him without a hint of effort. When it came to what he desired and inspired, Burton was simply a master of all craft. And when it came to charisma, Mike Todd was the world's greatest showman. Richard Burton was the planet's rogue lover, the worst bad boy in the best of delicious ways. This is the man who swept into Elizabeth's life and stole her breath, the way she stole the breath of others with her beauty, with his roguish brilliance and fearless consumption of life's great pleasures. The woman who knew Elizabeth Taylor the longest understood exactly what Richard Burton was. He was the first Mr. Swipe Right. I would guess her best passion was Richard Burton because he was, he had, there's something that um, rough necked English guys, Viking guys have that is just absolutely irresistible. You will die for them happily. I mean, I had, my last husband was one of those. He had this magnetism. Viking magnetism is the perfect description. And when your girlfriends see it coming, they know you're in trouble in the best of ways. I was pregnant and I had to stay in bed. And we would talk practically every day on the phone. And one day she said to me, I want you to meet Richard. I said, Elizabeth, I'm in bed and Richard is in robe. No, no, on the telephone. And can you imagine this voice on my phone? I almost had my baby right there and then. That is Doris Brinner, the other half of one of Elizabeth's longest friendships. Doris met Elizabeth just before Cleopatra and was there when the Taylor Burton fire ignited and burned white hot through all of their lives. Okay, so my name is Doris Brenner, B-R-Y-N-N-O. I was married to wonderful Yule Brenner which was the love of my life. I live in Switzerland, in the vineyards. It must have been 1960 or 61, maybe. We were staying at the Beverly Hills Hotel in Bangalore 12. And one afternoon, uh, my husband says to me, let's go over and have tea with Elizabeth. I said, Elizabeth who? Elizabeth Taylor. I didn't know anybody in Hollywood in those days. I said, Elizabeth Taylor, me, gone. Me. I was so impressed. So I painted my face and I combed my hair and I <gasps> off we went. And there she was with no makeup on at all, looking so beautiful. 
And I just sat there and stared at her. And the first thing she said to me is, why are you staring at me? I didn't know what to say, so I said, oh my God, because, well, here I am. I'm very happy to meet you, and I'm very impressed to be here. And that was the beginning of a great friendship, a real friendship, a real friendship. Now, but before the Cleopatra Fair, we met up in Paris, and she wanted to go and buy some sheets. But the rumor was out, and I remember being pursued by photographers with her and whatnot. I want to go and buy sheets. I want to, what shall the initials be on my sheets? And I said to her, Elizabeth, forget it. Don't do that because you might change your, your initials quite often. So she bought any amount of sheets and no initials. I didn't allow her to put initials on the sheets. That was just before the big thing erupted in Rome. That big thing was the biggest media sensation anyone had ever seen. Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton, known as the Taylor Burton Show. Listen, there's nothing quite like being in the global spotlight for your red-hot celebrity relationship. And no matter how many have felt that heat since Elizabeth and Richard, no matter how many hyphenates we all know, they all pale in comparison to the first. The Taylor Burton Show was a blockbuster. In Italy, the paparazzi did exist before the Taylor Burton show began, but only so much as to trail an actor here or a singer there, not around a celebrity couple. And these were the two most talented and beautiful people in the world, who were both married. It was an event. Rumors of the affair sparked a global phenomena. Fame ain't seen nothing before Elizabeth Taylor got caught in the arms of a Viking. She invented modern-day celebrity. We know that now. We know that the things Elizabeth was doing with, in the early days with Richard and Cleopatra, that the paparazzi was a concept before them, but basically the paparazzi came together and as a real thing with Elizabeth and Richard, and particularly them trying to capture their evidence that they were having an affair. There's a couple different paparazzi that took pictures and had a way of getting pictures, but there's one paparazzi with a super long lens, Elizabeth's in the bathrobe, they're probably around the dressing room with Richard, and it's very grainy, but you can see the two of them kissing. So that was evidence that there was an affair that could be fed to the world. So paparazzi really, that kind of paparazzi, you know, began with Elizabeth and Richard after Cleopatra and this big payday and then her affair with, with Richard Burton and the publicity that got, you see really the rest of the 1960s and that whole period in which she was with Richard Burton of just living the good life, living life to the fullest, going from country to country, living internationally. The, the, the whole love affair was a big news, but it was mainly on account of her because Richard was a super fantastic actor, but he was not worldwide known, like crowds gathering around him. All that happened with her. I, and I remember Richard, Richard coming here because his wife was making big trouble, of course, and he didn't have any clothes, and they didn't, I don't know, some papers were missing, and he lived like 20 minutes away from me here in Switzerland. And I remember he coming over saying, I've got to go to New York, I've got to do Hamlet, and I can't get a hold of my clothes. So my husband gave him some a couple of divine sweaters. And we went to New York and saw the play, the play, fantastic. And he wore my husband's sweaters on Broadway on the stage. I, remember, I don't know where Elizabeth was, but she wasn't there. Probably trying to divorce, trying to divorce Eddie. Poor Ed, poor, poor Eddie. <laughs> But all I can tell you, when the first time I saw them together, they came here to Switzerland, and I spent some time with them. And they were so, so, so mad in love with each other. You have no idea. And that was not pretending or anything. It was just, ah, oh, it gives me goosebumps. You know, it was really, really, really a big thing. I'm sure he was the big love of her life. It's the rarest gift to find someone to love who gets who you are. 
Elizabeth had it once already with Mike Todd, and for all the tragedies that life handed her, she also got this rare gift of being seen once again with Richard Burton. What is one of the things he knew, he saw, about what made Elizabeth Elizabeth? Jewelry, of course. Like Mike, Richard understood the nature of Elizabeth's passion for jewelry. He got the artistry of it, the beauty, the sheer joy that it brought her to be a temporary guardian of nature's eternal works of art. And of course, there was the sheer pleasure of giving Elizabeth Taylor a gift. But what Richard, the great actor, brought to Elizabeth's collection was an eye and the study of jewelry as craftsmanship. The workmanship in the settings, the provenance of the stones, the great jewelry houses from which they came. To master all of these things was pure Richard Burton. How could she resist him? Elizabeth I is presented by Rakuten, the most rewarding way to shop. Shop through Rakuten for everyday essentials and big ticket items alike. Clothing and shoes, toys and games, electronics, travel and kitchen or home essentials. Rakuten is the smartest and most rewarding way to shop and save. You can earn cash back at over 3,500 stores. Here's the best part. Membership is free and it's easy to sign up. Rakuten deposits your cash back directly into your PayPal account or they can send you a check. It's absolutely a no-brainer. You are in cash back for what you were already shopping for. So start all of your shopping at Rakuten. Your cash back really does add up. Rakuten has 15 million members who are already saving. Get the free Rakuten app and download the free browser extension to make it even easier to save. Rakuten also finds you the best deals, sales, and coupons. Head to Rakuten.com now or download the Rakuten app to start saving today. We spent a lot of time with jewelry, and it was really, really, uh, uh, she loved it. She just loved it. It was, it was a passion. She loved this jewelry because she, she was fascinated by these minerals, by these jewels, by the way that they look. She would take them out and, and, and just hold them and play with them. And from what I know she said much later in life, how she always believed that she was, um, especially with her jewels, a custodian rather than an owner of these objects, that she, she appreciated their value and it, it wasn't, it wasn't out of, let's say like, arrogance or selfishness. It was, it was, she just loved jewelry and she had the means to, her and Richard had the means because he, he, he bought her, you know, a lot of her big famous jewels. The most important piece that Elizabeth owned was the Krupp diamond. It's an Asher cut. That's a 33 carat diamond. The Krupp diamond was owned by Vera Krupp, who was part of the Krupp family, who had been involved in, the, in World War II. They had supplied munitions to the Nazis. When Elizabeth got it, she just thought it was like really a big fuck you to, to, the, to the Nazis, to the Krupps. Like, now look at it. It's on a nice Jewish girl now. It was such a beautiful diamond. I mean, I think she felt like it had been released and vindicated. And, 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 and it was her, really her signature piece. I'm not sure Elizabeth would say that, but she wore it in so many photo shoots. She wore it every day, frankly. Uh, you know, she wore it when she went to bed at night. One jewel became so famous because of the story of Richard buying it for Elizabeth, the world of jewelry and press spontaneously and unanimously named it after them. The Taylor Burton Diamond. The first celebrity hyphenate was born. So this amazing 69-carat pear-shaped diamond came up for auction, and Richard wanted to buy it for Elizabeth. It's before he bought her the Krupp diamond, which became the Elizabeth Taylor diamond. He wanted to get it for her. And he told their lawyer, Aaron Frosch, that he could bid up to a million dollars. 
so he ended up not getting the diamond because he'd only allowed a budget of a million dollars. Only. Aristotle Onassis was bidding against him. I think he was trying to get it for Jackie Kennedy or Jackie Onassis at that point. Cartier bought it for $50,000 more. Richard didn't get it and he was devastated. And he said he has to get it for Elizabeth. And I, probably he was competitive. He offered Cartier $50,000 more. And they agreed as long as it could be left on display in the store window in New York and then in Chicago. And it's called the Cartier Diamond at that point. And we have a scrapbook that Cartier put together. Once Richard got it for Elizabeth, it was the Taylor Burton Diamond. Richard felt like Elizabeth had to have this diamond, and he was really proud to buy her these big jewels. Like, it brought him so much joy. When somebody would go to the trouble to pick something special out for her that they thought she would love and they were right, that was the real gift. Barbara Berkowitz was Elizabeth's attorney for three decades and continues to be one of her great protectors. Barbara remained counsel to Elizabeth for the rest of her life, including providing legal services for the Elizabeth Taylor Foundation from its inception. I was once with her and I had to have her sign something. I love pens, whether it's a Mont Blanc pen or a Cartier pen. I like pens and I like fountain pens. So I asked Elizabeth to sign something and I handed her my pen and she started looking at it with her her eyes and I'm going, oh, I'm screwed. And she's like, Barbara, I really like this pen. Well, I didn't want to give her my pen, but I'm like, okay, I'll buy you one for your birthday. She liked what she liked and she wanted it, but she was also very generous. She would send things to people. Uh, One of the jokes in my household at the time when I was living at my parents' guest house is jewelry would show up. Well, my father said, how in the hell are you ever going to get married (laughs) with her giving you all this jewelry? Who can compete with this? I wanted someone to try, but I was, I'm very happy with Elizabeth's jewelry. It wasn't just the jewelry. Elizabeth and Richard both had the passion of artists who appreciated great art by others. For Elizabeth, it was an eye she inherited from her father, the art dealer. The Taylors knew fine things. Elizabeth knew what was great, what was beautiful, and it fueled her. By surrounding herself with great art, from fashion to precious stones to masterpieces, she was also building a legacy of wealth, like a boss. Ruth Peltison, the editor of Elizabeth's book, My Love Affair with Jewelry, saw it firsthand. We were working on the book at Elizabeth's home in Bel Air. And so in the home were, there are things like Oscars, statuettes, but there are a lot of paintings. And a lot of these paintings Burton had bought at auction or in a gallery. Now, as an art book editor, I knew right away what I was looking at. I walked in the room and I thought, what did I say? I said, Shazam to myself. It was really extraordinary. And, you know, we had a pretty good sense. We'd done a lot of our homework before we went there. But Richard Burton was sui generis. He had what we call a natural eye. He had an instinct for beauty, an instinct for beauty. Richard, and I call him Richard only because Elizabeth did, Richard Burton could see a bracelet and know it was great. Yes, then he'd get the bona fides from the auction house. You know, how many carats was the ruby heat treated or otherwise and et cetera. But he had an eye for beauty. And you can train a lot in someone. You can train someone to buy art. You can train someone to buy jewelry. You can train someone to decorate their house. But do they have a feel for it? Do they naturally come to it? He did. And I think that some of the most spectacular pieces, most important pieces in Elizabeth's collection were bought by Burton. 
And, um, and that's not even because, well, how long was he involved with her? It's because, yes, he knew Elizabeth loved jewelry, and yes, he loved gifting her with jewelry. But it doesn't mean that the gifts of jewelry were great. It just so happened that they were because Burton had that instinct, had that instinct. He had what we say that je ne sais quoi, I. So never for anniversaries, just when he wanted, just uh, when he wanted to give me a present. Mm -hmm. And uh, I called him, I love you, it's Tuesday present. And I never know, knew when he would come up with the most extraordinary thing or something sweet and simple. Uh -huh. We've been married for I don't know how many years. And we'd had Christmas and all the fixings and the food and the wrappings and the mess and the mistletoe and everything to clean up. Liza, who was maybe a foot and a half, and said, Mommy, Mommy, yes, sweetheart, what is it? Daddy said to tell you, you left a present in the bottom of your Christmas stocking. And she said it was way down at the bottom. And I looked at the size of the box, and my heart started to leap and bound. And I opened it, and this blaze of fire was the most perfect color stone I'd ever seen. The most perfect cut. And I let out the screen. I think I almost sang it, but I screamed, and I'm sure it echoed all over the mountain. And I couldn't stop screaming. Yeah. And it is the most exquisite, perfect ruby anybody's seen. And after, it took him four years to find this ring. Yeah. And I went running into the uh, living room where he was sitting in a big overstuffed chair, reading a book, I'm sure waiting for me to appear at some time after I got through screaming. I just threw my sad hat and <laughs> threw myself at him <laughs> and covered him in kisses and hugs and I, I just couldn't get over it. <laughs> I almost smothered him to death. And he was sitting there with this <laughs> Not all of her friends who gave her jewelry, expensive jewelry, did necessarily, but Burton did. And that was really thrilling. Oh, my God. It just piece after piece. I mean, historic pieces. You look at the diamonds. You look at the Gerard. You look at the, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. The VCA ruby and diamond ring. Chopard necklaces, the, oh, the Van Cleef and Arpels, the Angel Skin Coral and Amethyst Suite, the Lamartine, extraordinary pieces, extraordinary quality pieces. Oh, the Bulgari, oh my God, the Sugarloaf, uh, Sapphire Cabochon, the Sautoir, again and again, extraordinary pieces. That is the eye of a collector. Passion, instinct. Passion and instinct are pretty much what every collector needs. And after that, it's gravy. What can you afford? You know, that must have it. That's just, just that. Burton, it seems to me, was full throttle. He was a five forward gear guy. And I think those two, they made great star power. They made great passion. And they shared that passion for the jewelry. And uh, I think Elizabeth learned a lot about jewelry from Richard. And she knew her own taste. I remember one day she asked me to get her, she had a diamond, a white diamond and colored diamond tromblant brooch that was uh, bulgari. And 
I believe it was a gift from Eddie Fisher when she turned 30. So this was much later. She knew what she had. So whenever I would take something in, put something in the safe or take something out, I always looked at it first and to make sure it was there. And then I closed the box and brought it to her and presented it to her. And I showed her this brooch and she said, oh my God, that is so incredible. And I thought, but this is your brooch. You've had this for decades. And I didn't say that, but I understood. It commanded that kind of attention. It, it was beautiful. And for her to just say, oh, great, thanks. Let me just put it on. It didn't make sense. It was like, Every time you see something, you can still be excited about it. And Elizabeth wasn't shy about heightening things, you know? I mean, she heightened the drama. She heightened the fun. She heightened the glamour. That's who she was. Everything was heightened because she did that. But she was completely obsessed by, by everything, you know? Jewelry, thing, but jewelry mostly. She had in her... In her in her house in L.A., one day I arrived there and she had this amazing makeup room. And there was a big table and she pulled out all the jewelry for me to see lying on a table. She had, you know, about the famous diamond. She had fake ones made, I think, two or three. And I have one. I, I never dare wear it like a joke. It's huge, this thing on my finger. I never wore it. I said, I'm going to end up being killed on the street. Somebody's going to think it's real. And so I've never worn it. I wear it at home and I show it to people. It's so funny. Yeah, she had that made. We went shopping, okay, <laughs> on, I think it was on Rodeo. And Elizabeth wanted to try on rings. And she takes off the crup. And she hands it to the salesman, who starts to shake. That he's holding the crup. And she's nonchalantly looking at rings. Well, in the meantime, the security guard is locking the door. And I'm looking around going, what are you doing? And you see outside, people are coming to the doors, the double doors of the store. And he locks it so that there's not a stampede coming in. And then it gets so many people, he closes the curtains. Well, I never even noticed there were curtains on the front windows of this shop. And I said, what are you doing? He says, do you see what she's wearing? He goes, I'm just one guy here. And the shop, the, the salesperson, as I said, is shaking. I said, give me the ring. So because I don't need some, some guy holding on to her ring. And she starts to laugh, going, of course the lawyer is going to take the ring. Of course I am. I mean, I want to make sure she gets it back. <laughs> Elizabeth said, you need to get a piece of jewelry every time you work or something that matters to you. I always ask for a piece of jewelry because I love jewelry, but it can't be commissioned. I mean, I know that my business manager is going to pay for her mistress's, his mistress's boob job, you know, or I'm going to send kids through college. There's all these, my agent, my lawyer, my business manager, there's all these commissions. I want something that is just for me. And so that I can look at my life and look at my career and look at all these beautiful pieces of jewelry and be able to say, I did this. This is only for me. And that is very revealing story in, you know, in, in Elizabeth's life. She loved jewelry from the time she was a child. I mean, it was a complete passion for her. There is incredible savviness in the trait of Elizabeth's, the jewelry gifts she acquired and required as part of her studio contracts, are the perfect example of the interwoven value of Elizabeth's nature as both a boss in business and a woman of passions. All of it was authentic Elizabeth. I don't know how this person came to us, but we ended up with this guy, Jess Morgan, as her business manager. He said, you know, Elizabeth doesn't realize this or remember this, but I was around as some part of her management team when she was with Richard Burton. And he said, she ran that show. 
Richard was doing whatever Richard was doing, but Elizabeth was absolutely running the show, which was really important information because it's not something Elizabeth would have talked about. And it, I think it's just important to understand, you know, Eliz the, the Elizabeth Taylor, Richard Burton show was huge. We know that. And it was global. Elizabeth was running that thing. We have some expense report, like financial records from that period. And the amount that they were spending was spectacular, but they were also bringing in a lot of money too. You know, coming off of Cleopatra, her next three films, she pulled in over a million dollars for each. So it was, she gets out of the studio system, has this massive success, and then incorporates her own production company to employ herself essentially, and then loan herself out, you know, through her company back to MGM for a bigger payday. If you remember the original loan out agreements when she was at MGM between MGM and the other production companies, she literally flipped the script by incorporating her own production company, employing herself, and then loaning herself out and ironically back to MGM for the first two films she did after Cleopatra. These were The VIPs and The Sandpiper, both with Richard Burton and both for which she earned over a million dollars. Elizabeth's success in business was forged on the obstacles she faced, beginning with the fallout over that massive payday Elizabeth negotiated for herself with Cleopatra. And what was the problem? What was the go-to excuse from the men who didn't want to pay her? Her scandalous press. Always the press. A forever thorn in her side. We were sued. What these people that sued us tried to say was that our scandal had kept the audience away. Now, come on. So we sued back. Richard was wonderful. He walked into the lawyer's office, which was pride, something or other, and something or other. And he walked in and said, had a good, had a good day, Mr. Pride. Pride, as in cometh before a fall. <laughs> Mr. Pride didn't get it. It was bullshit. And Elizabeth and Richard fought it till the end. She ended up making over $7 million with all of the overtime. But they took away the 10% and they took her costumes away. So Elizabeth had negotiated 10% of the absolute gross. However, she lost it in the lawsuit. And they came in, all her, she had all the costumes and they came in with a big truck and took them all away, but she kept a couple. <laughs> Two, three were hidden away. They may have recovered some of Elizabeth's gross profits, but the studio's overages from their poor management of the production stuck. Elizabeth made her money, had her freedom, ruled her burgeoning empire. And the reckless studio, the corrupt system that had literally owned her and controlled her and forged her rebellious spirit, finally broke. Well, it, what's the beauty and the poetry in the whole thing is that Elizabeth, you know, went from the studio system, which is basically where Hollywood had been, did Cleopatra, it broke Fox. They shut down production on everything else. They had Elizabeth's and Marilyn's films in production, but obviously Marilyn's went away. And uh, so it was the only, and they shut down the whole studio. There was only one building that was operating us, it was the editing building, because they had no money and they had to get Cleopatra out. But it made a tremendous amount of money. It was not a failure. Whatever her disappointments may have been, Cleopatra provided the vehicle for the Taylor Burton sensation. Elizabeth knew that every time she stepped out, wearing a piece of her jewelry, she would be photographed. As her fame continued to skyrocket, she was making her jewelry collection just as famous, right along with her. Whether or not this was a conscious effort, it turned out to be a highly skilled use of publicity and the first celebrity use of the press 
to build one's own brand. Elizabeth was just being authentic Elizabeth. Wearing her jewelry out and about was who she was, as a woman who shared with others all that she loved. And the press multiplied around her because of it. There was no ceiling to Elizabeth Taylor's fame, no exhaustion point, no oversaturation. This escalating fame, it was new. Other celebrities couldn't figure it out. And despite the press concocted rivalry with another great beauty, Elizabeth was generous with her spirit when her rival needed it the most. It's why we have all those great photos of Marilyn towards the end of her life, because she was doing that to show that she was just as valuable as Elizabeth Taylor. I mean, Elizabeth certainly wasn't jealous of Marilyn. Actually, I think she felt kind of, um, kind of protective of Marilyn in a way, even though they didn't know each other. There was a person, but unfortunately he died last November. He told a story that Elizabeth had told him where she called Marilyn and said what the studio is doing to you because Marilyn stopped showing up on, stopped showing up on set. She was calling in sick and uh, saying happy birthday to the president on national television. She had called in sick. She'd been calling in sick and suddenly they see her on television. So they fired her and Elizabeth called her on the phone and said, Marilyn, I understand what they're doing to you and I understand that it's wrong. And I'm willing to walk off this set of Cleopatra in solidarity. Marilyn said, you know, Elizabeth, it isn't really worth both of us ruining our careers, but thank you. And Elizabeth said, well, let me give you one piece of advice. When somebody is telling you something that isn't right, you walk away and you just keep on walking. She did Cleopatra because she asked for an astronomical amount of money and got it. She met Richard Burton. He's a movie star. Now she's in a marriage with a working actor. And they made something like 13 films together, I think. And she also was making so much money that it was hard to say no. Now she had a partner in this. Now her husband was, an, uh, was a movie star also and they could make movies together. That is very different because Elizabeth could share this life with him and because they became, I don't know, the first multi-hyphenate, they were doing this together. And it was all headline news and they were knocking wars off the headlines. It's, all of that was super fun with your husband. And Elizabeth was in control of her career. But there came a point where the marriage was obviously having trouble. Passion could not triumph over tragedy with the second great love of Elizabeth's life. Richard was drunk all the time. And Elizabeth told me that he got sober. And I, I, I think she didn't, she didn't get sober. She saved his life because he was going to die. And she convinced him to get sober, but she didn't quit. And they got divorced, and Richard was sober. They got back together and married for the second time. But what Elizabeth told me is that he started drinking again, and she couldn't go through that. Cleopatra and the birth of the Taylor Burton era was a fiery and full expression of the complexity of Elizabeth's character in ways that the press used and manipulated around the sensation of her life events tragedies from which she survived and thrived. In this chapter, Elizabeth learned that the power of embracing her own authenticity as an artist, woman, and boss was the key to having control in a life of soaring fame. Throughout the ordeal, she remained true to herself and it would take her the distance. With this formula, when it came to power and influence, Elizabeth had longevity. But here's the thing about being a true influencer, at the level of Elizabeth Taylor and having longevity. The headwinds never stop. Despite all of her success from Cleopatra, the road ahead was not going to be an easy one. She would need to stretch and reinvent herself once again. 
in the eyes of the world in order to tackle what would become her life mission, her calling. Elizabeth Taylor's greatest passion has yet to come. On the next episode of Elizabeth the First. And I looked at Richard, where's the jewelry bag? This, mind you, holds my entire collection of jewelry, several mil. They were drinking and they were partying and they were making money hand over fist and they were buying jewels and they had houses and they had yacht. At that point, they started to fall behind the times. She sold her Rolls Royce. Wasn't a good luck. I was 32 and playing a drunk, screaming lunatic who was deeply in love with her husband. I think that was my favorite role. Elizabeth I is produced by Imperative Entertainment in association with House of Taylor and Kitty Purry Productions. Executive producers are Katy Perry, Jason Hoke, and Stephanie Koff. Elizabeth I is narrated by Katy Perry, produced by Jason Hoke, and written by Stephanie Koff. Sound engineering and audio editing by Shane Freeman and Jason Hoke. House of Taylor trustees are Quinn Tivy, Tim Mendelson, and Barbara Berkowitz. And its brand strategy consultant is Aaron Dawkins. Marshall Eskowitz and Kerry Schwartz of Sunset Boulevard serve as producing partners and represent House of Taylor for Elizabeth Taylor licensing and content opportunities. Joshua Klebe wrote and composed the original score. Additional music provided by Reese Tivy. Cover art and design by Gina Sullivan. If you'd like to support the Elizabeth Taylor AIDS Foundation, visit elizabethtaylorAIDSFoundation.org. And if you'd like to go deeper into the world of Elizabeth Taylor, keep an eye out for the first authorized biography about her life. Elizabeth Taylor, The Grit and Glamour of an Icon by number one New York Times bestselling author Kate Anderson Brower will be out on December 6. For more behind the scenes content, follow at Elizabeth Taylor, at Katy Perry, and at Imperative Podcasts on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Love the series? Don't forget to tell your friends and leave a review. Thanks for listening.